So, I mean, apparently okay. you can hear us. You just can't okay, see that, that, that is, okay, we're live. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll start and hopefully Toby will uh, be able to figure out how to get his microphone to work. But um, So I'll just start and then hand over to my colleagues. My name is Nick Lovegrove. I'm a professor uh, of the practice of management at Georgetown University um, and formerly a senior partner of McKinsey and Company. I'm uh, based here in Washington, D.C., where it's uh, 9.30 in the evening. Um, I'll uh, hand over to my uh, colleagues. Uh, firstly, Stephanie. Hi. Hi, um, everyone. Uh, wherever you are in the world, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Stephanie Camarillo. Um, I am the owner of a residential cleaning company called Molly Maid. Uh, I'm out of uh, Boise, Idaho. And I'm also here um, representing EO, which is the Entrepreneurs Organization. And um, I'm part of a mentoring program through EO. Okay, hand over to Robin. Hi everyone, I'm Robin, I'm Robin van Dalen, I have the full Dutch name here. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Unica Coaching, uh, we're a social enterprise tech startup on a mission to make top quality coaching not just accessible to the leadership, but to everyone in the organization. So from the CEO to the secretary, but also to street workers in Kenya. So we're quite ambitious mm -hmm. there and happy to be here. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Ariane. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ariane de Montvoisin. I live between New York and Switzerland. Right now I'm in Switzerland, so it's 2.34 in the morning. I've been very excited to have this session start. <laughs> um, my, it's my first for me. I've never done anything work-related this late. Um, my background is in media, venture capital, and having my own startup. And today I'm an executive coach to founders and CEOs on the same similar type of journey. I'm also a published author. I speak to companies and organizations around the world, specifically on three subjects. Uh, one is managing and navigating change. There's a lot of that going on nowadays. The other is all areas of wellness from physical, mental, emotional, and even spiritual wellness. And more recently, uh, issues to do with women and parents and how to balance that and productivity. Okay, and uh, Meg. Yes, hello everybody around the world. Meg Carlson, uh, I am based in Boise, Idaho. And my background includes a, a pretty deep and robust experience in food and beverage brands uh, for H.J. Heinz Company or Rida Foods. And then uh, and working in several startups, uh, building small brands from concept to small revenue to national or international distribution. And today my primary uh, area of focus is in serving as a mentor, advisor, and guide to other founder and CEOs of food and beverage early stage brands, typically have uh, about 100,000 to 5 million in revenue and are looking to scale more efficiently, more effectively, and hang on to more of their equity in the process. Uh, in addition, I'm also here representing the Entrepreneurs Organization. It's the largest peer-to-peer -peer, uh, entrepreneur organization in the world, and mentoring is at the core of what we deliver uh, of entrepreneur to entrepreneur, and I chair the Global Subcommittee for Mentorship. So I'm here to talk a little bit about mentoring from how we do it. Well, that's perfect, and, and we'd love to be able to introduce Toby. Um, and we can, he's there, um, and I'm sure he'll wait, but Toby, I think you're gonna need to sort of log, out, log, log back in again and have another go. Anyway, we'll, we'll keep going and, and hope that uh, uh, you're able to crack the code. Um, so, because um, Toby uh, wrote down his introduction, so I can read it out with a go smile ahead. of Toby. Perfect. Toby's a really nice man, so we shouldn't miss out on his introduction. So uh, he says, I'm Toby Tompkins, and I'm founder of Safio, a mobile leadership development platform. I apologize, but my mic is not working, so Nick will host the call. I'm happy to be with you all this evening. Great. Okay. Well, hopefully there's a technological breakthrough in the next uh, few minutes. Um, so we were going to start by 
uh, asking the sort of very straightforward question, seemingly straightforward, but probably tricky, of what is mentoring and how is it different from coaching? And Meg, you mentioned that, uh, that that's something you've given a lot of thought to, and I know Ariane has as well. So um, maybe, Meg, we can start with you, and, and then Ariane will follow up. Sure, that sounds like that will work just great. So mentoring is, uh, is relationship-based. And it's based on the principle that both the mentor and mentee come with a growth mindset, with an open mind to what is possible, and uh, and with a real commitment to learning. There's a, there's a saying that we have, which is, um, we can work really hard, but it won't compensate for flaws in our thinking. And the value of having a mentor who is challenging your thinking, asking you to view it from another perspective, asking you things that could go awry uh, in your base assumptions. And certainly this is very relevant today when many of us have built our business under a certain business model and certain basis of assumptions that have been turned upside down. Uh, I remember Fern Harnish um, saying that in a time of crisis, you can't think your way through it. You need to access experienced, uh, smart, wise people who have been through other challenging times and ask them to help you find a new path forward. So that is how I view mentoring. There's lots more we're gonna talk about today. You know, there's a lot of core traits around what makes a great mentor-mentee relationship. And you know, at the, bottom, at the end of the day, anybody with deep experience who is compassionate and a good listener and, and cares, uh, has their own experiences to share and can move into a mentoring role with somebody who asks for them to help. Super, thank you. So um, the other side of the equation is how is this different from coaching? And Ariane, I'd love your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's interesting listening to you, like there, there are so many similarities that I want to just share my experience. I've been a coach for 10 years. Um, and, you know, a coach provides a very safe, confidential, no judgment zone. In some ways, you leave all your roles behind. You leave your role as parent, as CEO, as whatever is going on. And it's sort of someone can meet you in a very different type of conversation you might not have with anyone else in your life. Um, you know, my commitment to clients is to give what I call a whole life coaching approach where it's not very often people's main problem is not business, even though they might approach me, you know, for a business challenge. Um, what might show up is an issue with a spouse or an issue with a child or an aging parent or a health issue, or they're going through IVF while they're trying to build a company. So, so coaches have the ability to really, you know, go to whatever challenge is showing up. Um, Coaches are pretty direct. They can be pretty tough. I know my experience of having been a mentor and having had mentors um, of all types uh, is that it feels like it's a little bit more professionally aligned and it's a lot more like a mentor is a little further ahead on a similar path as you have been. Um, my hope between mentorship and, and coaching is that mentorship feels like it's very 100% accepted nowadays. There's no negative connotations around it. Everyone can have a mentor. You can have plenty of mentors. Like everyone wants a mentor. And that's not quite the case yet with coaching. I feel like we've got a bit of a ways to go. Like I know I have half my clients are still very much in the closet about coaching. They are not out and saying, I have a coach. Um, I've had clients ask their, their CEOs or their, you know, their VCs, you know, can I get a coach? And their, their question is, why do you need a coach? Right? No one would ever say that around why do you need a mentor. So my hope is that we, we really normalize coaching to the same level as mentorship, um, where we see it as you know, necessary for high performance and where we see, we see ourselves as athletes. You know, any athlete of any normal, even minimal talent would have a coach. And so seeing ourselves as business you know, leaders or in any capacity, any form in the hierarchy, where coaching becomes something that is... Uh, that is very much accepted the same way as mentorship is. So can I ask the obvious follow-on question, which is, can a coach be a mentor and can a mentor be a coach? I would okay. say uh, affirmatively, yes. Mm -hmm. Which or both? Both. So can a coach be a mentor? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, as a coach, I'm trained in also methods of coaching and methods of, you know, asking questions and looking at limiting beliefs, patterns, blind spots, fears, and moving people through the gap between where they are and where they want to be. I know Mm -hmm. that a mentor, a mentor really brings a lot of personal shared experience is my perception of it. And Mm -hmm. some mentors definitely are very, very skilled. And I will just add to that. One more plug for EO is that the entrepreneurs organization actually has is very deep in formalized training for mentors and um, and as actually moving towards formal certification of mentors who have gone through the EO mentorship experience because we're highly committed to ensuring a positive outcome for everybody. So I suppose, you know, the reason to ask the question is because, I mean, there's clearly an overlap. I mean, it's a Venn diagram between mentors and coaches. But I think most of us would recognize there were times in our careers where we had mentors, but we didn't have coaches. Mm -hmm. So there are mentors who are not coaches as well. Um, And that, that what those mentors provided was not just kind of objective, independent, impartial sort of guidance and support. They were actively in our corner. If you say, what is a mentor? It's somebody who is helping me achieve my aspirations in a pretty active way, not just not just advising, but actually potentially uh, um, opening doors for me, for instance. Or um, it, it, does that does that resonate yeah. with you? Yeah. Yes, Let's- opening doors is, is pretty typical. Going right. beyond being just a sounding board and actually, you know, offering networking connections. Um, for sure, a mentor is usually doing that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so given that, um, we're talking about mentoring in very challenging times in this context, the pandemic uh, context, uh, which clearly poses uh, unusual, maybe even unique challenges for leaders. And uh, it'd be interesting to explore what are some of those very particular challenges that leaders um, need to pay attention to in in times like this that they might have experienced over the past year, mental wellness, sort of f- f- feeling in in control or out of control. Um, so let's just explore that. Maybe Robin and then uh, Stephanie could talk uh, to that. What are the particularly uh, particular challenges that leaders are facing in these circumstances? Yeah, I think that um, uh, the particular challenges they really are facing is like how to guide their people through this all right and i mean that's your role as a leader and leadership is really only coming really alive i think in times of crisis or in times of big changes or change times when leadership is needed right so i think this is the time to step up and really take care of the people that you're responsible for and i think if you look at the particular challenges that they that they could look at uh, we uh, have coached thousands of people uh, all the way from police organizations to healthcare organizations to civil society. And um, across the board, we actually see three challenges always coming back. It uh, doesn't matter where they are in the organization and what level of the organization, but three challenges that keep on coming back uh, in this pandemic situation. The first time is lack of joy. So people used to have hobbies. They used to go to family. There's just lack of joy. So helping people to create moments of joy, whether it's at work or outside work, but you may actively make time for that. I think that's a really important one. The second one is lack of structure. So, you know, you used to uh, go to work, come back to work, uh, then there's some events going on and all of that is gone, right? So people lose this, uh, when this time, when this work ending and starting. So really help people to create this structure. I think it's a really important one. Um, and the last one is um, uh, movement. So uh, we all have to ha- ha- used to have our natural ways that we moved around and we went somewhere and we, we really uh, walked to our meetings and we moved to our meetings. Now we're sitting behind our laptop all day, right? So there's really lack of movement that you can't go to the gym. So really help people to create these moments of move. So say like, okay, you agree with the whole company. We're all moving at uh, 3 p.m. and we're making a walk together. Or do something that we make sure we, we move or after every session, for example, after, after the meeting. So those are, I think, the three challenges that leaders uh, should really focus on. It doesn't matter where, where you are and what kind of leader you are and what country. Or This is really something that comes back across the board. All right. Thank you. Stephanie. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to, I thought that was great, uh, Robin. And I was going to add more kind of like of a personal story to this because I'm a, 
employer of a number of women um, in a residential cleaning company. So our employees are, are uh, they're not classed maybe as essential workers, but we call them frontline workers. So these are, these are women who um, can't be at home and have to be out there um, engaging in the community and have had to through the pandemic. And so um, as a business owner or as a leader, um, we've found that it's just been extremely important during this time to really lean in to our organization and maybe ways that we didn't before um, and to learn uh, to listen to some of the unique, maybe personal challenges uh, that were a little bit more in the background um, in the past. So some of those that we've identified uh, certainly to Robin's point are, um, you know, uh, especially with women, uh, that, that balance between um, being a caregiver uh, to children, sometimes being a single mom to children who many times were at home by themselves online or who had kind of um, back and forth uh, caregivers and balancing that desire to support their family with also the need uh, to work and to put to put food on the table. So as as a as a leader, listening to that and and brainstorming and being more flexible, uh, even with work hours uh, to, to to help them meet that need. Um, so that was one thing. Uh, the other I wanted to talk about was was kind of some unintended consequences uh, in the U.S. around some of the uh, financial uh, stimulus that we we did to get people back uh, to uh, or to I guess to support them. We have had um, in the kind of working class world uh, a challenge to get people to get off unemployment and get back to work. Um, so using mentoring to help people see the big picture and the importance of work um, and how um, sometimes a small stimulus doesn't make sense in a larger context of, of what a stable job can bring to them and their families. Does anybody want to add anything uh, to that, uh, Meg or Ariane? Not for me, nope. Well, let's broaden out, let's broaden out the discussion and then involve everybody in thinking about um, what works, what's, what's effective, how can um, mentoring leaders uh, be, be effective, um, and you know, what particular roles that formalized mentoring initiatives can play in, in ad addressing some of the challenges that you've described. And by the way, you know, just, as, just to add in you know, another uh, perspective about it, of course, so much of this is currently having to happen through this medium um, or media like it. And, um, you know, one of the uh, features of um, Zoom or whatever platform this is, um, is in one sense, it's an equalizer. Everybody is the same. Everybody's a, you know, three by five inch box on a screen. Um, and, the, you know, as I was saying, the, you know, the, the corner office has become the corner box on the, on the screen and the corner box is no bigger than the corner office. Uh, it's no bigger than anybody else's box rather. So you don't, you don't have many of the, as a leader, you don't have a lot of the sort of paraphernalia that used to go with the, uh, with the role. So you have to, you know, your p personality is, has to be everything really, because you don't have the big office. You don't have the, the large outer office. Um, you probably still have a substantial uh, support structure, but anyway, that seems to pose very particular challenges. So what kind of formalized mentoring initiatives, and with the emphasis on formalized, what kind of formalized mentoring initiatives uh, can be effective in sustaining a sort of psychologically safe, a high performing work, work culture? What are the kinds of formalized initiatives that, that you would um, suggest and that you've uh, uh, experienced? Um, maybe Meg, you could start on that. Uh, well, I think um, a formalized mentoring, uh, and I, I wasn't going to get into the details, but I think the value of having a culture that's committed to mentoring and growing the next generation of leaders um, reinforces the values of the organization as one of caring, of one that 
has a growth mindset that wants um, uh, people moving through their career in the organization to bring their best game every day and be willing to challenge status quo and not fall asleep at the job. You know, the smaller the company, the harder it is to hide in a company. But as you get as you get larger, you can hide. And I think if you have you're at each leadership level, you have that mentoring commitment as part of what your expectations are, then you're modeling the values of the organization. I spent 16 years with Orida Foods, very much a mentoring organization, and the style Can I just interrupt and say, can I interrupt, sorry, when you say very much a mentoring organization, what, what do you mean by that? I'm going to tell you that the style of development was Socratic method. It was questions. And I, I think, you know, it's it's easy for leaders to give the answer. And, and nobody learns when you give the answer. But through the process of Socratic questioning, uh, coming at it from different angles, asking them to think about, did you consider that? this, what alternatives did you evaluate and why did you eliminate them? You're you're helping train people to learn how to broaden their their problem solving and thinking skills and you're avoiding giving them the answer. And when you say the, it was a Socratic approach, yep. Yep. you know, was that an, a, an official sta- statement or was it just the way the culture had developed? It was the culture of the company. It had developed over uh, you know, decades and it was modeled from the top of the organization all the way through to entry level. Yeah, interesting. Ariane. So, you know, I would like to suggest that all companies, all organizations have at least one coach on retainer. Um, that is available as and when people need it. Uh, Because you never really know what life issues hit and when they hit. And I promise you that when they hit, it will affect their productivity. Um, I think one of the things the pandemic has shown is you can't expect people to sort of split their lives and kind of bring their work self, you know, and leave everything else going on while they're not working. Like everything is brought to the screen and to your current work. And I think companies, you know, to your point, Meg, it's sort of you need to see people as humans before as before employees. Mm-hmm. And when you see people as humans and they really feel that, then their productivity and then they want to serve, they want to give back, they want to work after they've put their kids to bed. But I think showing that there's someone there for them that's totally confidential, they can talk about hating their job or their boss, or but that it's it's a safe space for them. You know, I'm on retainer with a couple of firms and the 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 contribution that I feel that that has made to people in their jobs has been enormous. Um, so for me, yeah, every company, every organization, every government, put some coaches on retainer, put more than one so people can self-select if they're more comfortable with a, a woman, a person of color, whatever it is, but, but let them choose, right? Not you have to work with this person. I think that's pretty important. And again, that would speak to the kind of the culture that Meg's talking about. You know, you have to have a culture where that's accepted and indeed expected um, and it's not viewed as an indication of um, there's something wrong with you or um, you need to be fixed or something like that. It's just part of the environment of of, of self-improvement. Yeah, Robin. Yes, I think what the, uh, I think I want to really elaborate on the importance of uh, formalizing, um, because especially in times of inclusivity and diversity, and there's often a big gap between top of the companies and and what's going on in the rest of the organizations. Um, and I think it really helps them to formalize this mentorship. So because uh, usually the people end up in a top of the organization, they know how to build those relationships and how to build these mentorship relations. But how do you make sure this is like? You know, like we heard before, in the whole organization. And uh, I remember when I worked with Philips, what we put in place there together with the leadership, uh, which is now implemented across the globe, uh, is reverse mentoring. So that all the top 200 leaders of the company, they had a person under 30 that they got mentored by, you know. And of course, it was a mentorship relation, so it was mutual. But this way, it was really created this, this culture of safety that... Uh, yeah, the senior leadership is open to being mentored and learn from, from the young people. And of course, in return, they also mentor and, and, and help them to open doors. And I think that really makes sure that it's accessible, not only for the senior people who know how to build this mentor 
relationships with for everyone and, and it's more inclusive. Yeah, yeah, Stephanie. So I just wanted to kind of bring this uh, so because so, I don't I don't own a company in the corporate world, but sort of for more of a um, from my perspective, uh, we need to in all organizations, whether it's a construction company, a fast food company, a um, a cleaning company, look to build those mentor relationships even at that level because I have seen people rise just within generations from being at a working class job to sending their kids off to Stanford. So um, I think when you create a culture and you rise people up through that culture, um, even if it's not a corporate culture, it, 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 um, it does provide that mentor structure. So. Yeah. Toby is waving, but I'm not sure what he's waving at. So I'm afraid waving isn't going to. I think he means the, the text that he's writing down. Toby, you want yeah. me to read it out again? Yeah. yeah. So uh, he's saying that uh, it's part of a, creating a culture of care and care can be measured like in a healthcare organization. Uh, a care mm -hmm. can be measured like in a healthcare organization. What is your care plan for each of your employee groups? Yeah, no, I think that's absolutely right. And, and, you know, it also is, I mean, if I could just sort of add a, a couple of perspectives, it, 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 it does, I, I very much agree with Meg, it sort of speaks to what kind of culture you're trying to create and whether you're trying to create a culture of nurturing and support and encouragement and engagement of people throughout the organization um, and from, the, from the very early days. When people most need mentoring, it seems to me, is often in transitions, um, either on entry to come companies or into to you know where they're really trying to find their feet or where they've just been promoted or they're going through some kind of um, transition in role and they don't feel uh, they've got their found their feet yet so they need to need that support to just figure out what works um, and I mean if you think of that in a more of an institutional level I mean the, the concept of psychological safety has some in interesting features in it one is just enabling people to talk. I mean, it's very simplest. It is enabling to people to talk and, and make mistakes. There's a concept that um, Charles Duhigg wrote about um, at Google of uh, conversational turn taking, um, where you just go, as we're doing here, you literally go around the room. But it's relatively rare that people do that. You know, typically, it's, there's a very high uh, concentration of who speaks versus who doesn't speak. Um, so conversational turn taking, Microsoft has a concept called pass the pen. Um, where they sort of pass the pen around the room. I don't know quite how that works on a on a video screen, but you know, I'm sure they figured out a way. Anyway, all of these things are ways of nurturing people, giving them support to feel like they can can um, can contribute and can engage and can can make these transitions. So I'll I just ask an, an, another question that we wanted to explore. Is um, we we've, we've talked in in general terms about the role of mentoring in challenging times. Um, what another question is how is this affected by differences in age and gender nationality sexuality um you know, just differences in 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 type that that uh, might pose particular challenges and i'd be interested sort of maybe you could talk to one particular uh, type of of challenge that you think is particularly of concern uh, maybe meg you could start us on this um i i guess um I think diversity, inclusion, and equity um, ha has certainly emerged as a as a top issue of concern, and um, and and the concept that um, people are not are often not sensitive to the unconscious bias that they bring to work with them. Um, it's not something that we spend a lot of time learning about and talking about, and um, and so I think we are not as sensitive perhaps to um, when we feel like we're being natural, acting and speaking naturally, that the unintended impact can be um, offensive, off-putting, belittling. Um, yeah. And and I, I think to have a culture of caring and nurturing, you have to give people permission to call it. <laughs> I, I just think, you know, as a woman in corporate America back in 1982 for years and years, um, you know, grin and bear it was kind of what we were asked to do. And I, I just think yeah. you have to, you have to give people permission 
to, yeah. to you know, have a civil conversation in a respectful tone and say, I'm sure you, it was not intentional, but I'd like to share with you the impact those words have on me. Right, uh, it may be fair. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Ariane. My take is, I think a mentor or a coach, the most important thing is to enter into deep resonance and rapport with someone. Um, like I've been surprised, like some of the people that I've been asked to coach, that the depth of resonance I have with them and I have like nothing externally in common with them. And then I've also had, you know, white females where we haven't had resonance and I have, I have encouraged them to find someone else. Um, because it just wasn't working. And to sort of own it and go, I don't think I'm the right person for you. And, you know, it's always a surprise for them because they feel like it should be working. But just to, to encourage people to really feel safe and comfortable and like this person really gets you and understands. And, and it really goes both ways. I think the coach and the mentor also needs to have a self-awareness and a self-responsibility of, I, I don't think, I'm being the best person for you and let me help you find someone else. Nice. Um, and I also have found like, you know, I think as humans, sometimes we gravitate to people who are like us, you know, looks, profession, sexuality. And we think that that's mm. where the comfort is going to be, but sometimes it's not necessarily where the growth is going to be. Mm -hmm. like, I remember yes. having a mentor in my early thirties who's quite a well-known guy and he's, you know, six foot five African American banker, who I had very little in common with and I felt very safe with him, you know, and I felt like I learned a tremendous amount from him. So I think seeking out not only what's similar, but actually what's different, that's where some of the growth is really possible. Yeah. Robin. Toby wants to add to this because um, he says when that doesn't happen, like this feeling of people can be able to express themselves, I think at that point uh, we're talking about and feel safe to, to really speak up. Um, you risk creating fatigue, for example, the pervasive impact of unconscious bias uh, is black fatigue or any other form of fatigue mm -hmm. uh, where people feel they, they have to deal with these uh, things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want to add, add anything, anything, Robin, on that? Mm, no, I'm also, uh, I'm, I'm taking the lesson, uh, <laughs> what I just heard from Ariana, that I'm not the right person to respond. <laughs> I already said something before that I think uh, if you, it's very important to formalize these relationships because if you don't, then you exacerbate the inequalities that are there and you exacerbate yeah. exclusion patterns that mm -hmm, are there. Mm -hmm, so that's mm -hmm. why it's extremely important, exactly what I said before, to formalize and make sure that everybody by, de by standard just gets access to these mentorship relationships mm -hmm. or coaching relationship or whatever it is, but there's equal access, access and, and there's more focus on those who are more, uh, have more distance to that access. Yeah, I'd like to jump in real quick to Robin, which is, I think what so many people are looking for right now during a pandemic is a sense of certainty. Like there's so much uncertainty that if a mentor or a coach can provide certainty, even in the, we're going to speak every two weeks, you know, as opposed to call me when you want, you know, and then it puts the onus on the, the, the client or the mentee to call, but just kind of to give people the certainty that not only are you going to be there, but there's some form of scheduling and involved, I think is very important at this particular time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stephanie. So the only, these are great points. The only other thing I wanted to add is I think we need to pay attention to making sure that we have that diversity within our organizations, that we're, that we're, we have those faces and that experience for people to turn to, because I know early on in my career, when I was the only woman, you know, in a room full of men, um, I, 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 I would have felt most comfortable turning to another woman. So I know with the Entrepreneurs Organization, we have a diversity initiative to bring more voices forward. And I think that is, that's a critical starting point. Um, I'm seeing a mic request. I'm going to press on this. I actually don't know how this works, but I'm going to see if it works. Dr. Cora Butler-Jones. Um, Dr. Butler Jones, can you hear us? Can you? Can we hear you? Hi. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. Oh, yay! Hello, Hi, everybody. 
Hi. So I've been quietly listening to all the white people talking about diversity and the only black one not speaking at all. So I thought I would speak up. So, so it's not the we'd, we'd love it. We'd love now. him to speak, but he can't. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't offended at all because he said all the right things. Mm -hmm. Here, here's my spin on it. I have two corporations. I have a corporation that is Independent Social Work Services, Inc. And I designed that in 2008 to mentor social workers and to do various other community good at no cost. As I became wiser and older in my process, I now have a limited liability corporation that I started this year, which is my private practice, within which I mentor social workers and many other types of mental health professionals to the end of serving the greater good. My take on it is, the person who is most affected is whose view matters, whether it's the client, the staff, or the mentoree. We are never in a position, no matter what training, sensitivity, or awareness we think we may have, to superimpose our care, affection, desire to help on a person who hasn't invited it in. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the boundary that has to be imposed in, in all environments. We were trained, know these things, because we have ethical standards that keep us in place. But for the, the folks who don't, who are sort of, you know, um, doing really great work out there and helping support people, that invitation's important. I went to my jeweler, I, I had to pick up something for this conference, you know, jewels, <laughs> gotta get them. And her, the jeweler was late because um, my favorite girl that works there, father had died. And I was kind of mad that she was late. I didn't know why my jewelry wasn't on time. How could it not be? And they told me that her father had died and the whole place had shut down. So I got very sad standing there, but I, I my mentor hat went on because I'm off duty. And I said, is there anything I can do to help her? Because she's always so nice to me when she calls me. And they said to me, um, yes. And they came over to the window because they know she, she and I really go at it. And they said, what should we say to her when she returns to work? I said, well, please don't, don't go to Cooper Roth, the overused stage theory where you start here, you end there, and it's all done. I said, grief is a lifelong process. It's different for people. It waxes and wanes. But it's not this neat stage thing that begins here. It's not denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. It's not that. It can be, but it's not just that. I said, wait for her to invite you in and talk about it. Don't bring it up. Don't make it your conversation. Don't talk about all your loss to make her feel comfortable. Wait for her to invite you in. And the lady at the window said, wow, that's really, I would never have thought of that. And she's kind of coachy. So that's the difference between a licensed clinician kind of working with people and remembering boundaries and not kind of stepping over the line because you could get sued <laughs> versus, you know, a, a real more flexible nurturing relationship where there's a lot more give. Yeah. And so the same the with the AP. Sort of, yeah, I just want to make sure we have, uh, it's, it's, it's the willingness to serve, the willingness to help, the informality of that, that is as valuable as any structured relationship. Yes, um, sometimes more. Sometimes more, yeah, and in the moment, which is your other sort of in the moment when it's really needed. Um, mm -hmm. re reactions to that and, and, and thoughts. Um, got a, about five minutes to, to uh, wrap up. So let's just go around and just the reaction to what you just heard or any other points that you wanted to make sure that we covered in today's uh, session, mm -hmm. of tonight's session, uh, uh, Meg. Um. I really appreciate your jumping in here and sharing both your expertise as a professional and and also that's a lovely story. I've also gone through grief. I'm still dealing with it, uh, loss of a son. So um, what what you said totally resonated with me and um, and is is my truth is my truth. Um, I I appreciate the view, which is. Um, encouraging people to find a mentor 
is good if it's the culture, but each person has to come fully committed and prepared and, and bringing everything to that relationship. We, we, otherwise, it's wasting everybody's time. <laughs> I mean, it is absolutely, I'm, I'm inviting you to, to, to get to know me. And, you know, part of the process of mentoring is, is taking time. It's not a, hey, we got matched somehow, and now we're supposed to go out and, you know, have coffee and, you know, it's all going to be great. It, it, this is a relationship that develops into one of huge trust. Um, and it only happens over time. And it happens um, through uh, a, a sh an openness and a willingness to be vulnerable on both parties. Yes. And, and so that's what's really important, I think. Right, yeah, thanks, Ariane. Um, I'll keep it really short because I think we're all about to end. So I would say a couple of things. One is to both of your points, um, more storytelling and less telling. I think the, the power of a story um, can really connect and the world needs inspiration much more than information right now. And so your story is incredibly inspirational that you've just shared. Thank you. And, you know, I didn't feel I was being told anything. I felt I was being invited into a story and that story heals and it teaches. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing I would say we all need is lightness and humor where we can bring it in. And then the third, which is a big skill that I try and hone in for people, is just um, in increasing people's intuition. So less less above the neck and more below the neck. More heart, more intuition, more feeling, what's being said, what's not being said, what's being felt, what's not being felt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Rob, I think uh, Robert. you all are doing great mm -hmm. things and such Thanks. new things. Let's just, let's just allow Robin and, and Stephanie to wrap up and then we're going to be out of time. Robin. Um, yeah, I think real change happens, real change of changing thinking and your behavior happens in experience. I think the most powerful experience is in human connection. And whether we call it mentoring or coaching or we're talking about the beautiful experience that Dr. Cora just shared, um, I think that's really where change happens. And I'm really happy that all of us have a chance to make other lives work. So that's really cool that we bring people like us together. And I really wish that everybody has access to that all the time, you know, and if we can build a world like that, where it's just normal and part of our culture, we don't need to formalize it anymore, but just part of mm -hmm. humanity. Um, yeah, so an idealistic note. Thank you. <laughs> oh, and maybe also, Toby, you said, uh, what tools can we take away to help good mentors become great ones? and also practice self-care, but I don't think we have time for that question anymore. Those are great questions, we don't have time. Yeah. Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes, okay, thanks. so I would just say when we are learning and growing, I think as leaders, as individuals, as humans, and we're coming to our relationships vulnerable, then we are more able to both be a mentor and a mentee. And, um, and be part of that human condition because it truly is uh, it's sort of one of the highest and i think best forms of of uh, interaction that we can have so that's it fantastic well um we're, we're running we're out of time now and it's been, it's been great to uh, spend this time uh, with you um i'm having signs flashing at me saying time has elapsed so uh, we better wrap up and to toby we we had you there in spirit and through text but um sadly not through the voice of having brought us all together but um we appreciate it thank you very much indeed and i really think we should let Ariane go to bed now <laughs> good night everybody thank you, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much.